Okay, today on uh, The Frugal Fisherman, I'm going to teach you how to can your own salmon at home. Um, it's a fairly easy and simple process, and it's a great way to store fish. You can store it in these cans for up over a year. It stays great um, quality, and you can use it for all kinds of different recipes, and it saves on freezer space. Um, you need to get a few things together before you get started. First, and probably the most important, is your fish. This here is some fresh caught ocean coho I got off the Columbia River estuary just a couple days ago. Um, this coho salmon is a great uh, fish to can. It's got lots of oils, really bright red meat. I always take the skin off my salmon when canning it, but that's totally up to you. A lot of people actually opt to leave the skin on. They like it. I do. Um, you can also can um, Chinook salmon, kokanee, uh, chum, if, especially if it's caught out of the ocean, pink salmon. So really any of the, the salmonids, um, the red meat, pink meat salmonids are worth canning. Uh, you'll also need a little bit of vinegar. Another thing that's really important um, is your canning jars. Now. Depending on how much meat you have will depend on how many canning jars you need. Also, it will depend on the size of canning jar you use. I typically use these half pint wide mouth canning jars. I find this is a perfect sized amount of meat for two to three people um, for making things like salmon patties or salmon pasta. The wide mouth just makes it easier to pack the meat in there. Um, the narrow mouth jars, it's harder to keep the rim of the jar clean um, during the packing process. There's a couple companies that make really good canning jars. That's these Kerr, K-E-R-R, -R, or Ball canning jars that are made here in the United States. They hold up pretty well. Um, some of the cheaper knockoffs that come out of China tend to crack a lot more during the pressure canning process. Uh, you're going to need some paper towels just to wipe things up. Uh, you'll need a pair of tongs. That's for lifting the jars out of the hot water when you're sterilizing them. There's a specialized tool for lifting jars out of the water um, after they've finished canning, so these work like that. Um, there's also a small magnetic wand tool that's used for lifting lids out of the boiling water when you're sterilizing them. This helps to keep your fingers from getting burned, but also keeps the um, jars uh, jar lid sterile. And then finally, um, you'll need a fillet knife too to help slice up your meat into manageable sizes that can be packed easily into these canning jars. And then the last two things you're going to need are your pressure canners and um, either a burner or a stove top to heat the, the canners up. You can do this indoors on your electric um, stove tops or even your gas stove, stove tops is okay. I just like to do these outside so that if a can breaks in there, I don't get a lot of fishy smell inside the house. Um, there's different sizes of canners that you can use. This is a 12 quart canner. It's going to be able to handle a smaller load easier, um, up to get up to pressure faster. The bigger canners are obviously going to be able to handle more cans. This is a Miro. This is a Presto 22 quart. This is a 12 quart. You know, it just depends on what your canning needs are. Each canner that you have, you're going to need to have, um, there's usually a weight that sits on top that allows you to get up to the pressure you need. We're going to be canning at 10 pounds pressure, so make sure you have that. And the canners also have these protectors that lay down on the bottoms that keeps the jars off the direct heat so that they don't... Um, crack under the extreme heat. And you'll need several of these if you're canning a, a taller canner like this Presto 22 quart canner. Um, that way you can stack multiple layers of cans inside here. So you can can many cans at the same time. Um, a lot of the canners recommend not using uh, direct flame, but I know a lot of people who do and I've canned literally thousands of cans and never had any issue using direct flame on these canners. But I will say that it does say in all the manuals that you should not do so.
so the next step um, after you have all your equipment together is just to determine how many jars that you need. Uh, this can actually be a really difficult task if you're not really sure if you've never done this before. But I've actually found that pretty consistently that a single one of these half pint uh, wide mouth jars will hold about 0.4 pounds of meat. You have to leave about an inch of head space in the top of the jar when canning. So what you need to do is, uh, you know, fillet out your fish, um, pull off the skin if you're going to do that. Now there's lots of little pin bones in your fillets. The great thing about canning is you don't have to worry about these. Um, the extreme heat and pressure will actually cause those to completely dissolve. So you can just leave them in there. Saves you a lot of headache and um, makes the process pretty easy. So I've uh, filleted out all my fish here and weighed it and I got about 8.95 pounds. So I divide that by 0.4 and I get about 22 uh, and some change. Um, so I should be able to fill about 23 jars. So I'll just go ahead and sterilize 20, 24 of these half pints just because that's a full load. Um, that way just in case um, I find a crack in one of these or a crack develops during the sterilization process I'll have a backup ready to go. So that's what you need to do next. Figure out how many jars you have and we'll move on to sterilization. Okay, before we start sterilizing our jars, uh, if you have new jars, they come with the uh, lids and the rings attached. So we'll need to go ahead and take those rings off and if you're like me, you have tens of thousands of these rings. Um, but you want to set aside these lids. So get all your jars um, with the lids and rings removed, ready to go, um, which might take a while if you have a lot of fish to do. So that's the first step. Okay, the next step before um, you start sterilizing your jars is you want to inspect your jars for cracks. I've already done it. New jars generally won't have any, but if you're reusing old jars that you've canned before, make sure you hold them up against something white or a light background and make sure there's no cracks in the base. Um, also make sure you have the disc in the bottom that will protect the jars so they're not sitting right against the direct flame. You just want to start stacking in your jars. So I'm just going to stack my full 24 jars in here quickly. Okay, so I got all 24 jars stacked in there. Uh, we need to fill it with water to just above the top of the jars. Okay, after this is full um, above the rims of these jars, you just want to go ahead and turn on a medium to medium high heat. You can also gently place the lid back on to cause it to heat up a little faster. Basically you want to get this to a boil, a uh, rolling boil, and leave it at that for 12 to 15 minutes to sterilize the jars. Okay, so while your jars are sterilizing in your canner, it's time to take your salmon meat and chop it up into smaller pieces that can be more easily packed into a jar. So. You know, lots of little pieces are going to be good for topping off your jars, but you know, it's good to have some decent sized pieces that will fill uh, most of a jar so you can really start laying them in there efficiently. So, depending on how much fish you're doing, you know, just make sure you chop up some of the fish into larger pieces and also chop up some of the fish into smaller pieces. All right, you might want to put this in the fridge or a cooler with an ice uh, if it's going to be a while and go check on your uh, jars that are sterilizing and we'll get started once they're ready. All right, so we've been boiling our jars for about 15 minutes. So they're probably pretty good and sterile. So I'm just going to carefully take this lid off of here and not burn myself. Um, so now this is why I asked you to save those uh, cardboard containers that the jars came in. You can also just use a cardboard box. Lay a 
sheet down in the bottom like a, a towel or rag um, to soak up some of the water. We're going to use this to transport our jars to where to the fish meat where we'll start packing it. This way that uh, soaks up the water. If you just put it right on the cardboard, it might uh, the cardboard might weaken and it might just fall through. So use those tongs that I showed you earlier to pick up the jars, pour out the water, and set those aside. So go ahead and get all the jars out. And sometime um, while you're packing your jars, you need to start uh, boiling the lids. Um, so you need to pour some water into a small pot, put all the lids that you need in there, and uh, go ahead and let those boil for a good five to ten minutes. Comes the next part is to begin packing our jars. Now you want to make sure you have your knife handy so that you can cut down um, some of the meat if you need to in order to pack these jars. And the main thing that you want to try and do when packing these jars is to keep the rim as clean as possible. Um, you can go one step further and actually screw on one of these lids onto the tops of these um, to protect the rim, but you need to make sure these rings are really clean um, when you do that. I generally get away with uh, just doing it without the lid on top. So when packing these jars, you want to, it's kind of like a game of Tetris. You're trying to find ways to fill the jar as much as you can. You, you want to eliminate any open space in there. And you can use your fingers to really mash the meat down into the crevices and fill the jar up. But you want to make sure that you leave about one inch of head space to allow for the meat to expand during the heating process and the gases inside so that it doesn't reduce the jar's ability to seal. Yep. Um, you can add extra ingredients at this point. You can slice up jalapeno peppers and lay them in, on top or on, mix them in with the meat. You can do chipotle peppers, barbecue sauce. Some people even lightly smoke their salmon before packing it like this. Uh, the sky's the limit. You can add whatever you like, garlic, uh, mustard, whatever flavor you want to add. Um, a lot of the canning recipe books call for a pinch of salt. That's totally optional up to you. I tend to just like to do straight meat and uh, add whatever I'm going to add to it when I am cooking it or using it in a, for preparing a meal. Okay, so I ended up with 22 jars, which is pretty close to uh, what I estimated. I estimated 23. Um, so the next step is I need to clean the rim of the jars, and the best way to do that is to use, uh, take a paper towel and use some vinegar. So, soak a paper towel and some vinegar. There you go. And then what you want to do is wipe the rim of each jar, maybe changing the side of the paper towel every couple times, so that you can get the rim perfectly clean. You have to have it perfectly clean in order to get a good seal. So wipe down the rims of every jar. Okay, so now I have all the rims of the jars wiped. I went upstairs and I grabbed the pot that had the uh, boiling water with the lids inside of it. Um, so you, by this point you should have your salmon packed in there and any other ingredients you're going to add. If you're going to use salt, be sure and use non-iodized salt. That would be canning salt or kosher salt, or are both okay. Um, just a small pinch in there will be enough. So what we need to do next is apply the lids. And there's this specialized magnetic tool I was telling you about. I'm going to pull those out and start laying these lids directly onto the tops of your jar. And then your next step is to take and apply the rings. Now, when screwing the rings on, you don't need to put these extremely tight. Just just you want to get them snug, but you don't want it so much that uh, air and uh, liquids can't escape from the can if they need to. So just get your ring on there. 
and just, like I said, just just snug but not overly tightened. So go ahead and apply the rings to all of the jars. Okay, so before we start the canning process, um, you need to read the instructions for your canner. Each canner is going to be different about the amount of water it requires. This canning of salmon takes about over 100 minutes, so you need to make sure that you go on the upper end of the recommended uh, water amount. Um, I, with this 22 quart, I'm going with about 3 quarts of water. Now you can use warm water um, or cold water, but make sure you don't use really hot water because this can, this salmon that's in these cans is still pretty cold. Um, and the shock of the temperature difference may cause the jar to crack. And one final step before you uh, start the canning process is to make sure that uh, the vent is clear on your um, pressure canner lid. So you want to hold that up against the sky and make sure you can see through the vent area here. This is this leads to the pressure gauge. This one leads to the vent. And also make sure that your gasket is in good shape and oiled. I use canola, olive, or vegetable oil to to lubricate the gasket so that I get a good seal. Um, after you're done with that, you just need to start stacking your cans in here. Um, make sure you try and use the spacers between your cans, between each level of cans. You know, I've oftentimes, when I don't have enough spacers, I'll stack cans directly on top of one another. They move around a little bit in the canning process, but as long as you have a good stable platform, you should be all right. But I recommend using these when you have them available. So go ahead and start stacking them in there. And when you're stacking your last few cans, if you don't have enough to fill the canner completely, try and stack them in a way that they're fairly balanced so that you don't have one more weight to one side than over another. Then you need to go ahead and put your lid on your canner. Make sure you get a good seal. And you want to light your canner. Go ahead and start at medium high heat, but not, not the highest setting, just somewhere between high and medium. And we're going to wait till it starts to vent. Venting is when you get a steady stream of steam coming from this vent here. In the meantime, while you're waiting for that to occur, you should get out a sheet of paper, and I find it useful to write down vent start and end. Venting takes, you want to allow it to vent for 10 minutes. So when you start to get a steady stream like a geyser like Old Faithful, you want to write down the start time, add 10 minutes, and that's the end time. When you hit the end time on the steam, you're going to apply your weight. We need at least 10 pounds pressure weight. Um, each one of these will vary depending on the model and brand of uh, pressure cooker you use, but Make sure you figure out which one is 10 pounds and after you have hit the end time you'll just put that on there and then you're going to pressure can for 100 minutes and you don't start the 100 minutes until it actually hits uh, the 10 psi mark on your pressure gauge if you don't have a pressure gauge on your canner you just have to wait till this starts rocking back and forth and kind of sounds like a train coming like a chick -chick 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 -chick, a real steady uh, rhythm to it and you're at your pressure, you want to write the start time down then, and then add 100 minutes to the end time. But I'll take you along that process as we go. And uh, yeah, so we're through most of the difficult part now, so let's just wait until this starts to steam. Okay, so now we have a steady stream of steam coming from our vent. So I want to go ahead and start the timer and write down on my sheet of paper the start time, which happens to be 6.07 p.m. here. So I know at 6.17 I'll need to put the weight pressure gauge on the vent steam release valve. So I need to put the weight, the 10 pound weight on. And what we're going to do is, um, you see that the pressure immediately jumped up there, so there was already quite a bit of pressure built up. 
This is going to build up to 10 and then it's going to start rocking back and forth to release pressure. Now if you get a lot of steam releasing around the edge, that means your gasket has failed or you didn't put the lid on quite right. So if that's happening, turn it off, let it cool down, and then go back and try and address um, the issue and try and problem solve it. So once this hits 10 pounds PSI, I'm going to start my timer and let it can for 100 minutes. It's also a good time to grab a beer and uh, sit back and relax because uh, it's going to be a long wait. Okay, so we're at our 10 PSI. You see this is rocking back and forth. Now if you have a canner that doesn't have a pressure gauge, you're looking for this sort of slow rhythm in the uh, pressure release weight. And that sort of tells you that you're at your, your target canning weight. Um, mine tends to, even though this is a 10 pound weight, it tends to hover right around 12 PSI, which is fine. So now I just need to kick back and let it go for 100 minutes. Okay, so we've hit the 100 minute mark, and what I need to do now is turn off the heat. Uh, now we need to let it depressurize on its own. So you need to leave the weight on the pressure canner until this gets to zero and this pressure button drops, and then you can take the lid off. If you remove this uh, weight prior to that, it will rapidly depressurize, which can actually cause the cans, the jars to break. So you want to let it cool down. That typically takes 15 to 30 minutes depending on the temperature outside on its own. Um, but once it hits this zero and this drops, you can take the weight off and take the lid off and then we'll remove the cans and inspect them. Alright, so I ran out of daylight so I had to move things down into the basement here but my pressure is at zero and the pressure top has dropped. So we're going to go take off the weight and then take off the lid. Now be careful if you um, have just turned off the heat and the pressure finally hit zero. There's still a lot of steam to be built up inside there so when you remove the lid be careful not to let the steam burn your hands. And you can start using uh, this tool. This is the one that grabs the cans out. And you can also put these um, on a towel if you're putting them on a colder surface, but this table's pretty warm. Now the lids have a little nipple on the top that lets you determine whether or not they've sealed properly. They should be concave. You can kind of see that little dimple there. It should be concave, it should be depressed in, that shows that it's sealed properly. If the lid is still popped up, then it hasn't sealed yet. Um, sometimes they take some time to seal. Um, other times they're all they all seal within the canner pretty quickly, especially after they've depressurized. But sometimes they'll still seal as they're cooling. So you just want to take them all out. They're still extremely hot even an hour after I took the lid off or took the heat off of them. Take them all out. You'll want to Leave them overnight if you're doing this in the evening like me, or you can let them sit for a few hours so that they're not too hot and you can take off the rings if they've sealed. If they didn't seal, the best thing to do is just to put it in your fridge and uh, try and eat it in the next couple weeks, or you can freeze it and it'll be okay for a while. Okay, so it's the next morning here and it looks like all of the cans are stayed sealed overnight. Uh, the meat looks really good, nice and pink in there. So it's some pretty big air bubbles in that one. But it's still sealed very well. So all I gotta do now is just take off these rings. You can leave them on if you want, but otherwise um, you're pretty much done. So you can just uh, write with a sharpie marker on the top to label it. And, or you can use a little bit of tape too. Uh, you might want to wipe down. Sometimes there's a little bit of oils get on the outside of the cans. You can wipe those down. They'll ruin your markers. Otherwise, uh, it's good to go. Delicious canned coho salmon.